Okay, good afternoon. I see Mr. Mitchell. Got a lot of people. There's Miss Lou. She's also signing in. <clears throat> is that your client in the background, Mr. Mitchell? It is. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Just want to be sure we got our necessary parties here. Let me call our case number. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, CR 2023-159, State versus Alexi Treviso. Diana Luce is the district attorney. She's appearing for the state. Mr. Gary Mitchell appears as counsel for the defendant, and she is also appearing in person, virtually in person. So, counsel, we've got several matters to uh, go through this afternoon, several motions. I wonder, do you have a preference as to the order I was proposing we deal with a venue change as the first order, but if you have something else you'd rather take in any other order, I'm fine with that. No, Your Honor, I can do with the venue. It'll be pretty quick. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's your motion, Mr. Mitchell. I'll let you tell me what I need to know. I don't hear from Ms. Luce. And I do have your pleadings here, of course. Sure, and I'm not going to repeat those. Your Honor, classically, we'd have a hearing over whether or not uh, – Eddy County is free from exception, and I'd file affidavits and do all that. But the new basis for doing these change of venue motions virtually has turned into something that was suggested several decades ago uh, by uh, judges like Allen and, 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 and some of those judges. Uh, whenever we would, uh, they suggested that rather than do change of venue motions that we send out and ask the courts for questionnaires and we send out questionnaires that we ask people to fill out under oath and then the council reviews those questionnaires to see if we chant if by perchance we can get a jury which seems to be much cheaper and a and frankly a better way to do it i uh miss loose kindly sent me the latest questionnaire that they used in a similar case out of hobbs or out of lovington mm -hmm. uh, I, I got that. She and I can make some modifications to that. Uh, the trial date you sent earlier today is acceptable to me. Uh, I think it's acceptable to Ms. Luce, and we can figure out with you and the court clerk when we should send those questionnaires out via Google, however we were going to do them. That's up to the clerk, but I'll get with Ms. Luce. We can work up that jury questionnaire get it sent out once we get the new panels that would be sitting for that trial. Uh, and then when we get the information, we can figure out when counsel can sit down and go through that uh, with the court, uh, move to strike certain jurors who, uh, by the answers on the jury questionnaires, have given us sufficient information for which they could not sit fairly and impartially, and decide if we have enough jurors to select from, and then uh, go from there. I would propose that to the court uh, as a way to resolve this issue rather than have a lengthy hearing today uh, over whether or not this case has nationwide publicity, countywide publicity, statewide publicity, or world publicity. It has all of them, frankly. So uh, trying to move to another jurisdiction uh, may not, in New Mexico, may not be very suitable since the whole state uh, has some of the same media sources and and particular social media has been so explicit in in this particular instance. That's the solution I propose. All right. And are you on board with that, Miss Luce? I mean, it sounds rational. We all know there's no place to go that somebody hasn't heard about the case, which is not that's not the standard for qualifying or disqualifying. But nevertheless, there's no place we can go that would be any different. In my my opinion of, than Eddie County. And I think that's what I'm hearing from Mr. Mitchell. Are you on board at least with the concepts? Uh, yes, Your Honor. That's why I provided the supplemental questionnaire we used in the case that we tried in Lovington um, so that he could see the questions we did. Obviously, he and I can confer. If we can't agree then uh, on it, we can have a hearing before the court. But I think if we can agree, then we can just submit it for the court's approval. The court can submit it to the clerk's office, and then they'll, they'll uh, digitally upload it. Uh, as they did in Lovington, and then they'll send it out paper for jurors that need that. But I think that resolves that motion for today. Okay. And, and folks, let me take this above my pay grade. I don't know how Martha does her 
work down in the clerk's office. But my suggestion is that we get with her early enough. And, and this trial's not gone anytime soon. So we should have adequate, adequate time to let her know we're going to have to get an unusually large number of jurors pulled in uh, to examine a panel. I mean, just the length of the trial alone is, is going to make it difficult to get an adequate uh, veneer to pick from. So at least we've got some ramp up time and, and then I, I'll kind of, I'll let Martha know, kind of be warned, we're going to have to have a really, really large number of uh, prospective jurors to sort out, I think, in this case, just to get enough people to sit on a panel. And, and I think you told me you expected six weeks to try this. Is that right? Yeah, that's what I estimated. But a lot of that goes to jury selection. But if we do, I, and I found, I don't know if Ms. Luce has found this to be the uh, uh, the solution as well. I found if we do a, a, a decent supplemental jury questionnaire, that uh, cuts down on the amount of time we need for voir dire. So we may be able to get it done within four weeks if we're not having to do it. So you're counting the six weeks, a good part of that you're counting also pulling the jury, right? I am. Okay, okay. Okay, so the actual trial portion won't be six weeks. You were accounting for finding a jury to sit. Right, I counted two weeks for jury selection. Okay, okay. All right, well, we will keep that in mind, and I, I will just try to start anticipating and plan ahead as much as possible on getting that taken care of. Okay, all right. All right, so that issue's off the table. I've got two other pending motions. I have the one to modify conditions of release. Then I have the other, which is the motion to suppress, motion for protective order, exercise of privilege, and the Pena Espinosa procedure determination. Which one do you want to handle next? You're muted, Mr. Mitchell. Me, let's do the privilege one next. It's okay. all of them because I think uh, I, I can argue the whole thing and we'll save the, uh, the release provisions to last. Okay. There's also a motion that I filed, the state didn't respond, but to take the deposition of one of these, uh, of one of the, uh, uh, I'll think here just a second, uh, the toxicology experts that's in Pennsylvania. Uh, the oh. state, the state's some of their lab testing to Pennsylvania, and uh, I didn't, want to be without that expert for whatever reason but that's something we can do later but okay. we probably need to take the deposition uh for purposes of trial of that particular witness so we're not either one of us hung out to drive when we need that toxicologist and uh, we don't have them available because they're more than 300 miles away so, so this is a toxicologist for the state and you need the deposition of this toxicologist am i right on understanding that Right. At the, at the preliminary hearing in this matter, the state objected to my just getting into that with the forensic pathologist and or any other doctor saying we need to have the toxicologist here. I want to avoid that. I've dealt with that issue with the same toxicology group before where okay. we tried to bring them from Pennsylvania and and uh, or the state tried to bring them from Pennsylvania. And normally somebody calls me and say, Gary, can we take their statement or their deposition? And and uh, that's all I'm saying. We just need to oh. take position okay but that's not right for today we're going to put that up for another hearing right that's right judge i'll talk to diane about it to okay. Ms. the district attorney about it see if we can reach an accommodation if we can take her dep take that witness's deposition and okay. introduce the report the report's what i need and and or mm -hmm. the state may need whichever one of us needs it thank you okay. All right. All right. i'm ready to argue on this motion to exercise okay. let me uh let me say, and, and there was some confusion yesterday, but we didn't send these exhibits, but to the court via your email and to the district attorney via her email. So I, these are exhibits I still think need to be sealed uh, for purposes, but I sent exhibits A through I, just for the purposes of this hearing, they're not to be admitted at trial or anything. I'm not asking that. Just for purposes of the hearing, they included, uh, uh, the, the records of the hospital, which I think are privileged, uh, and for the court's edification, the, re, the two lab reports that we needed, 
And then we had certain police reports. And I noticed uh, and looking here, both officers are present. Uh, I guess we could take their testimony if we need to, but I attached their reports, Williams and Anaya. And then there's a videotape that the state doesn't have that I'm aware of, nor do I have, but I've seen on people sent it on social media. It's from Artesia General Hospital. And it's a videotape of my client going from the from a examining room uh, down the hall to the bathroom and then coming back. Uh, another Artesia police officer took that tape, figured out a time schedule, that's exhibit G, a timeline. Uh, I believe that was Officer Minter, and I attached his report showing the timeline. And then there's a, the videotape that we seek to suppress where police officers, the doctor, and my client are in the, in, and her mother are in the examining room. That's the Miranda issues. And then I did a timeline of a timeline of events to give the court without your having to examine every medical record to give you a timeline of what we're talking about here. So I'm asking that those be admitted for purposes of this hearing and that they be sealed. All right. Is that any objection, Ms. Lewis? Your Honor, I don't have objection to the video, to the police reports, to the lab reports for purposes of this hearing. Um, the timeline <clears throat> that has a caption on it appears to be um, Mr. Mitchell's work product summary of what this, what everything purports to be and purports to happen. If that's a proffer by him of what evidence is and the court is to consider it only as a proffer, um, the state doesn't have an objection. Otherwise, that's basically argument. Um, and the state's going to object to that being a written document um, with us only getting it last night uh, coming in before the court. Okay, I saw a thumbs up, Mitchell's from Mr. Mitchell, right? Uh, Judge, and I, and I knew that, and I expected to just use it as a proffer of what the uh, records show. Uh, uh, Ms. Luce didn't say anything about Exhibit A, which are the medical records that came from Artesia. I copied those straight from what the state gave to me. So I don't know if the state has an objection to those. You're going to have to look at them some point in time to decide what is going to be admissible and not admissible under the privilege. Now, counsel, I don't have any of these actual exhibits you're referencing. Where are they? Have you tendered them? We sent them to your uh, PCA via email hey. yesterday, and she That's should have them. You did? Okay, she said she sent them to my email. Let me check. I'm sorry. I missed them on my email if, if she did. Hang on a minute. Let me look. It's a lot. It took several emails. I think we put them on a. I'm not sure. I've got one that does not appear. It's just, it's a reference. Here's the link for exhibit F. That's not it, right? Well, there's an exhibit F, but there, we put them on a link for purposes of the court. I didn't anticipate that you'd be able to go through them all. I figured you might take some under advisement after you heard from counsel today. I will do. And Emily, will you do this? Print them up for me. Just print them and we'll put them in a, a folder also because it just helps me to have them in hard form. She'll get them up and I'll look at them later. Will that work for you folks as far as this goes? It will, Judge, because okay. the, the okay. argument is going to be... Uh, uh, anyway, okay. I, I, I do need to know if the state objects to exhibit A, which were their medical records. Your Honor, not for purposes of this hearing, um, for the court to consider them. Um, I have any objection to any of these as we, um, as I've let defense counsel know, being um, sealed, not public for purposes of the record for various reasons. Um, and so um, I, I don't have a problem with that, uh, Your Honor, but I, I just wanted to make sure that the one that is, I believe, I, um, the timeline of events was the proffer to the court. Um, since it had a caption on it, it appeared to be prepared by Mr. Mitchell or his, with, along with his staff. It was prepared by me, Judge, and a proffer is all it is. And I, okay. that's really okay. put the style of the case on it. So okay. That, okay. All, all right. right. So, all right. All right. With that said, let me hear your argument, Mr. Sure, Judge, and I'll be as succinct as possible. Our 
And when you when the court reviews the argument that Ms. Luce made regarding HIPAA and the argument I made, we both agree under the law there's not a remedy under HIPAA for one exercising the privilege. There are fines that a hospital and doctors pay for violation of HIPAA, but that has to do with the, deal, the Department of Justice and their investigation and, and Medicare and Medicaid and whatever they decide to do. But for the individual, uh, there's no remedy under federal law under HIPAA that you, that you could exercise. You can't sue for damages uh, or anything like that. So my purpose in bringing this today, if, however, is under New Mexico law, and I cited the court to this, Rule 11, 504 is a physician patient privilege in the state of New Mexico that we believe applies. And I, in my brief, cited the court to Bertrade and Roper, which are the two key cases for the exercise of that privilege. Our position is we have not waived this privilege in any way. We did not sign a waiver. It applies to the doctor, it applies to all hospital personnel, it applies to our teacher general hospital. And later on, it applies to the hospital uh, in Roswell where she was taken. So let me, and that's one reason I attached a timeline so the court could know. This entire case hinges around what happens in a bathroom and the emergency room of Artesia General Hospital on the date in question, which was, uh, January 27th of 2023. The timeline will tell you that there's one admission sheet that says 1203, but by 1205, she's in the emergency room. Uh, and then within a few minutes, she receives medication uh, and uh, through an IV and uh, including morphine and several other different kinds of medication. It's a timeline would reflect. Without getting into that too much, she uh, she's examined by an emergency room doctor. She has a nurse that's there. People come in. There are the hospital asks for a UA they, they, uh, they, and blood. They do a blood test, and by 12:51 they know that she's pregnant. And then we know when it comes to this privilege that, according to the and they happen to have a video camera or some type of camera in the emergency room part of Artesia General Hospital that shows her leaving her room. And we know from the records that at 139, she leaves her, she's, they go in, they unhook her from the IV, uh, let her get up. She virtually runs down the hall, trots down the hall to the bathroom and then, according to the police report that you have from Officer Minter of the Artesia Police Department, who reviews that video and goes through it, she's in the bathroom for approximately 18 minutes and then leaves the bathroom and goes back to her room uh, and, and then uh, uh, by a certain time period, and let me pull that up so the court, so I can speak intelligently to the court. Um, we know that at, after the 18 minutes in the bathroom, we know she's back in the room. And we know that emergency room personnel go in and, and they begin, the, the cleaning staff goes in and they begin to clean the bathroom. And uh, later at, uh, and, and that begins at 2.08. And then by 2.27, uh, they uh, find the baby. And at 2.38, the nurse, I mean, the doctor pronounces death. And then police arrive after that. So when the police arrive, the, the doctor wants to wait for the police to get there. I don't think this is disputed at all. She waits to talk to our, to the Artesia, to the two officers from Artesia Police Department, both of, of whom I've attached their reports, the sergeant and uh, 
uh, the officer that came in and I've attached those as exhibits. So they come in, they talk to the doctor and then they go in the room where she is. And the doctor walks up to her and asks her and tells her they found the baby and ask her, uh, says something to her. You have the videotape of that. It's a lengthy videotape uh, for you to examine of that time period uh, with the officers there. The officers both say in their report that uh, they told her she was detained, could not leave, and uh, and uh, in, in, in for purposes of Miranda, I would argue in custody and not free to leave, which means that at no time is there anything read about Miranda, which gets us to the suppression issue. But back to the privilege, the key question is to determine when does this privilege apply? Well, it applied from the first time she went to the hospital. That's real clear under the rule and under the case law, and it applies to everybody there. And really the state's case is uh, the time in the bathroom. And then it applies afterwards as well. So my position to the court is everything that takes place between the time she goes to the hospital all the way through is privileged information that the doctors and the nurses could not give out to Artesia Police Department, could not give out to anybody without without a waiver from my client, and we've never waived it. In addition- Now, what is, are you talking statements made by her and her medical records? Yes, Your Honor, and that would also include lab reports and stuff. Okay. Anything that happens at our teacher general hospital, and there's a case on that as well that says, hey, okay. that includes lab Yeah, reports. I want to look at the annotations. I don't see that. I'll have to pull it. Let me ask you another question. Is information, because obviously cleaning staff, what, about two hours after the event? Is that what you said? They go in around two in the morning? Yes. It's a little past midnight, cleaning staff goes in around two-ish, right? That's correct. And they discover the deceased child. Yes, after they're in the, I can tell you the exact times on that okay. based upon uh, uh, the records and stuff. At 2.08 in the morning, the ER staff, uh, janitorial staff started cleaning the bathroom. At 2.27, they call in a male nurse because of what they found in the bathroom. Okay. They found the baby. And then it, uh, that nurse takes the baby into an examining room. And at 2.38, the doctor pronounces the, the baby deceased. So let me, okay, so let me ask this. Uh, notwithstanding a doctor-patient privilege, what about the hospital's obligation to report the deceased child? Is that privilege? Are you claiming that as... Okay, okay, that's where I was headed. Okay. They have a duty to report it. They call 911. It turns out that the police were there uh, the emergency room wasn't busy, but it turns out they were real close by anyway, and they were there quickly. Uh, but now they have an obligation to report it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this, uh, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Really, everything, there's the state's case hinges on what happens in the bathroom, and there are no other witnesses but my client to that. And okay. whatever, whatever the experts are saying, whether it's OMI, my experts are, and such uh, are going to say about that. But basically that's the situation is that for that 18 minutes, uh, there are no other witnesses. And, but everything before that, because there's no case before, uh, she doesn't have the baby except in the bathroom, judge, that's the point. And uh, before that, there were no issues that I think aren't covered by the privilege. And then after that, obviously, uh, she's uh, they, they end up taking her to a room. Obviously, people see all the blood, and uh, and they realize they have to do some examination. The doctor goes in, doesn't talk to her because they don't know that she had a baby, but they think there may be other complications. And then uh, after they confront her, the doctor and the two police officers. Uh, in her room. Then after that, the doctor uh, intervenes again and says, listen, I've got to get her to, I got to helicopter her. We got to air back her to uh, Roswell. We don't have people here in this hospital to take care of it. And she is bleeding to death uh, if we don't get her treatment at, 
at Lovelace and uh, Roswell. So they they air vector to uh, uh, Roswell after that. And of course, the police let that happen, although uh, she was in custody at the time that they went into the room. The doctor specifically states in the reports, and this is not in dispute because it's in the records and it's in the police reports. The doctor deliberately waits after she finds, after they find the baby, the doctor deliberately waits until, uh, and no other staff goes in, until police officers arrived and they all go in at one time. Uh, and that's where we get into the Miranda issues. So for the privilege, I'm saying everything's privileged up to the time she goes into the bathroom, everything's privileged after she comes out because uh, it's all part of the uh, uh, the privilege. Okay, and now let me stop you here because I want to clarify. I'm looking at Rule 504. We have the doctor-patient privilege. This is an exception to the other rules. Who has the obligation? Does the doctor, is, and is this in case law? I'm not seeing it here in the privilege. It says, who says, who may claim the privilege? Is the doctor obligated under this act or anything else to invoke it or at least advise the patient of their privilege or invoke it on behalf of their patient? What is their obligation? The doctor and the hospital's obligation is until they have a proper waiver of that privilege, they can't talk about it. And here's- okay. And, and then she has to make a knowing waiver after being advised what her right is in that in event to waive it? Well, right. there's no case law on what a knowing waiver is. That's always been, did she sign a waiver? Okay. Uh, you know, we've always done that on a case by case basis. I'm not going to tell mm -hmm. you that I have a particular case, although okay. having done this in civil cases and in other cases, classically, uh, there's a written waiver that is signed uh, that you can waive that. Uh, and that's not done in this case. And my client is not okay. a child. She was 19 at the time. They had, they had the waiver from her. They never got it. And here's the problem for all of us in this case. Okay. There's a huge problem is the is mass media, social media, how it got out is, I guess, an issue that the district attorney and I will have to look to sooner or later. But the truth is, it got out. All these records, all these videos uh, were out. Now, somebody from Artesia had to disclose that. Every one of them gave a statement to police. They shouldn't have without a waiver. They all gave records they shouldn't have without a waiver. They gave a video they shouldn't have without a waiver. Or there's, and classically, when you read the case law, there are three ways. Number one, uh, you get a waiver from the patient. Number two, a court orders it. There is no court orders in this case. They didn't go down and say, judge, we need a search warrant. We need, uh, we need an order from you. Uh, ordering the hospital to turn over the stuff to us. They never did that. They just did it. And then, uh, in fact, there's a videotape uh, in this case where the officer goes in and asks the administrator of the hospital, what do I need to do? He says, well, just send me an email. That doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it under HIPAA. It doesn't cut it under this rule. So my point is, is that the privilege applies. Now, uh, I could choose to waive part of that as her attorney or she could waive part of it. We haven't chosen to waive any of this. And as a matter of fact, the state knows this, uh, at the very beginning of the preliminary hearing in this case and the motion, what I did was Mr. Mitchell, I was muted. You're muted. Something happened. I don't know what. Can you <laughs> can you repeat everything you just said? I am sorry. It just my uh, screen muted you. Uh, 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 I don't know how long I was muted for, but here. Let's go back about sixty seconds. I think. Well, I'm sorry. Here, here's the point, Judge. I've never waived this on behalf of my client. My clients never waived it at the preliminary hearing in this matter, and the motion to set conditions of release. I objected right before we ever got started receiving evidence uh, to the court exercising the privilege. 
alerting the court to the issue, alerting the court to HIPAA, alerting the court to the doctor-patient privilege, and my belief that it covered Artesia General Hospital in this case. Mm -hmm. And we had, and he gave me a continuing objection throughout the entire hearing, and I've never waived it since then, and I've never waived it before this court. So that's what we think is covered by the privilege. So all these medical records, all of these statements by doctors and nurses uh, that were taken without waiver, all of the lab reports, not the state lab reports, not those that come on the examination of the baby, but those that were examination of my client, that would be the blood test results, pregnancy test results, things of that particular nature. All of that is privileged. Everything there is privileged and should never have been disclosed. Uh, and we need a determination from the court that it's privileged. And if the court decides it's privileged, then unless I waive it, or or uh, there's another, and I don't know of any other reason because the privilege is a privilege, under Roper and then Bertrand and the rule, uh, that remains privileged and cannot be used in court. So that's the argument on the privilege. And I'll submit it to the court in that regard. And then we can argue the suppression issue later. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'm looking at the act. Privilege is that to be claimed by the patient or their guardian or custodian, which doesn't apply. It is a, it is a personal right by the, by the patient. And it says who may assert the privilege on their behalf would be their physician or whoever treats them. Authority to claim the privilege is presumed absent evidence to the contrary. Exceptions, well, it says by order of the court. Okay, so I understand what I'm looking at. Let me hear your side of this argument, Ms. Luce. Your Honor, uh, basically, defense uh, in their motion uh, raised three issues. Um, they raised the issue of Miranda, they raised the issue of HIPAA, and they raised the issue of privilege by the rule. Mm -hmm. Let me start with the issue of Miranda. Okay. Uh, the issue of Miranda, um, she was not in custody. Um, statements that she made once the police were there were actually statements initially that she blurted out officers asked her no questions uh, and then uh, her mother uh, who is present uh, with her in the treating room the entire time um, uh, is saying things to her um, and the officers actually tell the mother to stop uh, that she you know has Miranda rights and that she should be advised uh, and so we think the Miranda issue is really not an issue. There, there's not a violation of Miranda. And we put that in our response. The second thing is HIPAA. Uh, the defense puts HIPAA in here. HIPAA is really a uh, red hearing, has nothing to do with the criminal case. There's no remedy. It's not a constitutional protection. It's a statutory protection in which um, a, a penalty can be against the facility, the physician. Um, and that is the civil suit that, um, two civil suits, I believe that defense counsel has already. Yeah, and I think Mr. Mitchell doesn't disagree with you on that point. Right. Well, you no, know, but he put it in his motion, Your Honor. And so, okay, for the purposes of the record, the state's okay. just making an argument. But he acknowledged um, to me that the HIPAA is a separate, it's a federal issue, it's a remedy that doesn't even run to the patient, apparently. Right, right. right. Okay. So it really had no place in his motion, but it was there. Um, so the third is the rule. Um, and so let's start with um, defenses kind of uh, combined a lot of things together. Uh, statements made by treating personnel, doctors, nurses, um, records, video. Um, he's kind of lumped all that together. Uh, the state doesn't believe that's proper. First of all, uh, the, the uh, defendant's mother, this defendant is an adult, the defendant's mother was present at all times. You can't have privilege if a third party is present in the room. Uh, and so... You just went mute again. I'm having trouble with this. I think it's our system. Okay, go ahead. It's about 10 seconds. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I think. Um, 
the defendant's mother is present in the room with her uh, at the at the emergency room. Uh, she's not with her in the restroom, but she's with her when the nurses, doctors, anyone is speaking with her. You can't have a privilege uh, if you have a third party present. Uh, you've already, by your own actions, letting your own mother be there, waived that privilege. So statements that are made um, are not going to be protected under this rule. Uh, she's an adult. If she was a minor, that would be different. So statements, that's one thing. Um, You're muted again. Records, um, the uh, hospital records, um, the uh, police department uh, uh, was given the records, but they did apply for a search warrant and obtain uh, records uh, properly uh, by court order. Uh, and so a claim of privilege that we didn't get them by court order uh, for a crime, um, the state believes that uh, that is the exception. Uh, and allows us to use uh, those tests from the lab uh, as well as the records. Um, the third thing is apparently the claim of the security video for the hospital for the hallway. Um, the state would submit. You're muted again. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Your Honor, it's showing that there's somebody on uh, as a participant that is muting people, just so that the court knows. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. If anybody's trying to mute, please stop messing with the system, all right? You can mute yourselves, but please don't mute my litigants here. All right, go ahead. So, Your Honor, um, the, the video in the hallway um, defense is arguing that that video is privileged. Um, the hallway would be a public corridor within the hospital. It's not a private patient room. It wasn't the restroom. Um, the fact that other people can access that hallway and be in that hallway, we don't believe that there's any right of patient physician uh, confidentiality for a public hallway. Uh, it wouldn't be any different than um, when the court has a closed proceeding in the courtroom. Uh, Whatever is going on in the, the hallway of the courthouse is, is not a protected secluded area. And so for them to try to argue that because it shows a bathroom um, in the hallway where um, she comes in and out of, that doesn't make it patient protected privilege. Uh, so I think really you have to separate out the three. Again, go ahead. The three types of evidence involved um, from um, statements that are made where her mother is in the room and then later the police are in the room. Um, it's definitely argument for defense counsel to say that the doctors deliberately, intentionally waited for the police to go in. Um, I think that's probably at this point um, an assumption on behalf of defense counsel because we've had no doctor testimony to say that. Um, but um, either way, uh, the fact that the mother was already in the room, uh, there's no there's no right of privilege. There's no claim of privilege that's been waived. She came with her mother. She allowed her mother to be present. Uh, the court would be familiar um, that uh, a patient has a right to not have other people in their room. They ask if it's okay if that person stays. Uh, that's normal treatment. Um, the state would submit. So, Your Honor, we believe there, there are three different things going on here. Uh, and for defense to lump it all in and say it's all privilege uh, before the court, uh, we would uh, we would disagree. Uh, and so uh, we don't believe uh, there is a privilege uh, based on um, our, our uh, argument to the court. I do have the officers on if the court wants to hear from them, since it is a motion to suppress of what happened once they were there. Uh, once they were in the room, they they were then had body camera 
the reports have been submitted. I don't know if the court deems that sufficient. If you want to hear from them, that the state is uh, glad to put on these witnesses. We would also ask your honor um, to be able to submit proposed findings and conclusions uh, because this is um, a rather intricate um, uh, argument. And I believe the way the defense has uh, framed it and the way the state is framing it are very different. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I, and I, and, it, and it, it is apparent to me there may be some distinct acts or events that occurred that are privileged or may be privileged. I'm seeing other. I can't lump this into one event, a long running event. I, 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 I think we've got for example, I'm thinking that the, the, the whatever happened in the hallway, which I think is just a video of her going from, I guess, a treatment area down the hallway into the bathroom, right? That's a public area. I can't see that that video would in itself be a privileged video. I've got other questions about other parts. I do think it's a good idea that you submit findings of fact in this case. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Mr. Mitchell. I've got to tell you, I don't know how much of it I did see, but I was aware, I think it was around the time the pretrial uh, uh, detention hearing was occurring, which I did not conduct. That was not assigned to me. That was Judge Finger. There was something on the news, one of the Albuquerque channels, which I think was the video you're referencing. I think there was a physician. He, I guess he was an ER physician. Judge, you're on mute. Yeah, I just was. Who is something? Okay, somebody named Jad SD56 mm -hmm. is muting us. Please stop. Are there? I'm going to have to ask him to leave this hearing. He just he just left the the meeting, Your Honor. Okay. Well, that helps. <laughs> And Judge, you were asking a question when you went on mute. Yeah, I think I, <laughs> I was going I was I was telling you that I saw part of I was just passing through a room in my house and there was some news report. This was immediately after the pretrial detention hearing was conducted. And it shows a video. Uh it shows a I think it's the ER doctor, I don't know. I believe it was, and there was a police officer, I thought it was a state policeman, a police officer, and there was conversation going on. That's about all I know about that. That's the one you're referencing. Is that right, Mr. Mitchell? That she no, was not, no, uh, no. That, um, the over, that came from an interview later on when the police are interviewing the various uh, nursing staff. That's a charged nurse that you're talking about uh, oh. that you were talking to. He also okay. was the one that that uh, took the baby from uh, from the uh, took the baby from the bathroom into an examining room and called the doctor uh, okay. to come down. Uh, that okay. took charge nurse. Different. So t talk to me about. Here's what I have on my mind about the uh, the state alleges that that uh, Ms. Treviso waived any privilege by allowing her mother in the room when she was in this. You say it was custodial investigation or or interrogation. She was, is it, does anybody dispute, she was advised she was not free to go, right? Is that undisputed? Well, they say so in their reports. And Judge, I gave you the video. You have the video among the exhibits I produced. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll see that later then. So You can see exactly what happened. But really, in answer to the court's question, number one, my client's mother came with her into the emergency room. Mm -hmm. and she was present. Uh, except when she went down into the bathroom, she was not present in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, she was present during most of this. And then she was present later on when the, when the doctor and the two police officers come into the room. Now, I wanna be real clear about these facts. After the 18 minutes, you see my client go down the hallway to the bathroom. And then 18 minutes later, she leaves the bathroom and she comes down and goes back into the examining room. Now, the doctor went into the examining room to do a, a, a quick vaginal exam because they didn't know what had happened. They had not found the baby at that time. Okay. And they do a quick vaginal. They, they, she gets undressed. They do a vaginal exam. None of that's recorded, obviously, on video. It's in the privacy right. of the room. The doctor's there, but they have not found the baby yet. And so 
uh, again, the mother is present then. I want to be upfront about this. And then, mm-hmm. and then, th- then the, the cleaning staff finds the baby and then they call the charge nurse. The charge nurse takes the baby into an examining room and then mm-hmm. calls the doctor. And then it's after that. And this was testified to, and I know uh, uh, I say this very respectfully to Diana. She wasn't the attorney that handled the uh, the preliminary hearing. You're muted again. Diana, you're muted. I don't know what's going on there, but I'll keep my finger on it, Judge. <laughs> I know. I'm not touching a thing. And <laughs> uh, We may have so many people on there that, that that's the problem. Uh, anyway, I was saying that after after the uh, uh, after after they find the baby, then is when the doctor, who also testified at the preliminary hearing, uh, indicated she waited uh, after they found the baby to go back and talk to her patient, my client. Uh, until police got there. They called 911, the police were there. We're not talking about a lengthy period of time here. We're talking about within minutes, uh, really quick. And and uh, the police were there, the sergeant comes, the officer comes, and then we go, then they talk to the doctor, they go in the room, and in the room at the time is my client, her mother, the uh, doctor, and the two police officers are standing and she can't leave. And that's in their reports that by that time, they've got this information. They have a baby that's deceased. They have a doctor, they have the baby and they have uh, information and they're going in to talk to the mother. And Della, let me interrupt you there now. Miss Luce has asserted that because her mother apparently was already in the room, that statements made by your client were, I guess, impliedly waived because her mother was, and she's an adult. I think it's based on that. I mean, if, if she were a minor, it'd be a different situation altogether. Can you address that? I can, and you need to address it in two ways. Number one, what is the presence of the mother due to the medical doctor-patient privilege? That's mm-hmm. number one. Number two, what does it do under Miranda suppression rules? Well, the latter first. Under Miranda, it doesn't matter who's present. Uh, they have to read her when she's in custody and she couldn't leave that the officers were there. They say it in their reports. Uh, and then uh, uh, they don't read her Miranda. The doctor asks a question. It's, and you can't do that. I've cited some cases and wrote on that in the response or the reply to the response. And that's a different situation. And I, Miranda would still, you're muted again. And whether or not that gets suppressed or not is the uh, uh, determination the court has to make. That's a different and separate issue. Now, does the privilege at the hospital apply with the doctors and everything with the mother being present? My position is, I'll try to do some further research on this. I agree with Diana. We need to do findings and conclusions mm-hmm. and, and, and give you some case law about this so you're not deciding this thing in a vacuum. But my position is the the doctor-patient privilege still applies because we do this all the time in hospitals. We have spouses present. We have uh, family members present because they brought them in. And a lot of times the people aren't in their right mind to make decisions anyway and need a family advisor. We do this in hospitals all the time. I'm sorry. It doesn't get... Whoa. Well, okay, you're good. <laughs> wow. It doesn't get rid of the privilege. Uh, okay. it's, my, it's my position. All right. That's what I really, and that's going to be a real important factor for me to, to examine when I, and I do think before I make any really hard decisions, you're, you're getting my impressions on stuff, but I would really like to have your uh finding of facts, conclusions of law before I, I, I am really have studied this. So that's something I'd like both sides to give me some authority on about that. It, is it impliedly waived if you allow another person in the room? All right. 
All right, Judge, that's that. I think the other issue was this that you had before you today was a modification of the uh, release provisions. Uh, mm -hmm. Judge Finger cited to the domestic violence section and issued a ruling that my client not have uh, physical contact with her boyfriend, or the father of the child. And uh, even though I don't know what he could testify to in this case, that the state considers him a witness, they can consider him a witness. But here's the problem. And we've honored that. Uh, I mean, he was present during legal proceedings. Uh, but in, in the courtroom, when we had the, for example, when we had the uh, preliminary hearing, he was seated in the audience. Uh, that's the, and uh, okay. here's, here's, here's the problem uh, that I'm asking. They both attend the same university. Okay. It's a large, the second largest university in the state, but they both attend the yeah, my client is trying to, to stay at home like and stay and take classes via from the university. So we tried to avoid that problem this semester because I didn't have an order and hadn't had this heard before then. But I'm asking that the court take a look at the motion uh, and the state's response, because one, I don't believe we can order that in that fashion. Uh, because of the cases I cited to the court, including Johnson and uh, some other cases. Uh, and and two, uh, she has not violated that whatsoever. The judge allowed him to, communi to, to communicate via telephone and or, uh, gosh, there's so many different media ways to communicate, but they couldn't be in person. And she's honored that. She doesn't go out at all uh, other than to come to my office, the court allowed her to go see her grandparents. And other than that, she's at home. She doesn't go out. You don't see her at Walmart, anywhere else. But going to college and, and of course, her professors, even though she's doing this by Zoom, I'm not sure what they're going to require when it comes time for examinations as to whether she can do those via that method or she has to go to uh, down to the uh, university and take examinations. We're trying to avoid all those problems this semester, but uh, in any event, sorry, we have some time uh, to consider this, Judge. But uh, wow! <laughs> in case you need to have more time to look at it, uh, or the state needs more time, but uh, I would ask that 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 restriction of being able to have contact and uh, with her boyfriend be removed. And that, uh, uh, and the other reason for bringing this is I didn't want her to get me in trouble in another city because they run across each other in a classroom or on the campus, even if it were by accident. I mm -hmm. mean, we're just trying to do everything up front. Uh, uh, there's not been any uh, issue otherwise. Thank you, Judge. Okay, let me ask you some questions because I'm kind of limited on what I can pull up and do my own research well, I have my screens up here. I can't quite do that. It says, it, the, the, I guess the authority that the prohibition was issued is under 3311B. Can, some, can you summarize that for me? What, what is that? That is the domestic violence statute. Um, let me, hang on just a second, Judge. I can pull it up real quick. Let me get okay. to the argument. Give me just a split second here. Your Honor, it's the uh, nature of the relationship. Okay. That's what the court was citing to in the conditions of release at the pretrial detention, defining continuing personal relationship. Th that is correct. Um, and, but my, my point is, it's not under, this is not a domestic violence situation between the two of them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that statute shouldn't apply. What should okay. apply is that we can't, I mean, she hasn't been convicted of anything. She's not on probation. And uh, as long as they don't discuss the case, uh, they should be able to see one another. And that kind of prohibition, uh, and I don't want to get into all the marriage okay. equality cases, but that's those are the cases in which really the rights that you have in that regard have been uh, explicitly spelled out by our Supreme Court in the cases that I've cited to the court. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Well, I was wondering what, because I was think I was thinking that was under some domestic relations ruling. That's what I thought. Okay. So this is under the DV statute. That's yeah. The party that was used to prohibit the contact. It's it not. Because, it's not because he's a potential witness. Is that right, Miss Lewis? He's not going to be a witness in the case. Your Honor, I, he could be a witness, but at the point that Judge Finger made in the findings, he mirrored what Judge Schubert did in the Alexis Sabia case, mm -hmm. um, was that he did not want her to have um, a relationship that could result in a pregnancy. Uh, and we end up in uh, a similar situation again as to what had occurred. That That is what Judge Finger was doing uh, in restricting. It was restricting uh, contact. And uh, the state disagrees with defense counsel that the court doesn't have the authority to do that. Um, the analogy would be a DWI case and the court saying you cannot consume alcoholic beverages while this case is pending. Uh, once probable cause is found and probable cause has been found, this court can set restrictions to ensure that uh, there is no conduct that could lead to uh, a further crime uh, in, involved in this case. And that is why Judge Finger made that restriction. He used that definition because, you know, they weren't married. Um, that maybe they weren't officially boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, he used that continuing personal relationship to say that she was not to have that. Uh, the court can look at what happened in the Alexis Sevilla case out of Lovington with Judge Shoebridge. Um, he specifically restricted her from having any contact with any male individuals that were not um, family individuals. Um, you know, obviously she had people that lived in her home with her um, uh, because of the nature of what had happened. Recognize in that case, that child survived. Um, this, this case is different. And so uh, the state believes that the court can fashion conditions of release that allows her to attend a university that um, this same individual could attend. Maybe they're in the same class, maybe they're in the same lab, the same bookstore, the same restaurant, but it's no different. She, There's no reason for her to have a, a relationship with this person based on what the facts of this case are at this time. They haven't made any showing that there's any they, they didn't bring him in to testify. They didn't bring in a proffer of, of what's going on. Um, and, Your Honor, we believe that that condition is appropriate based on these circumstances. You have to remember uh, part of the state's case that we believe that is not privileged are her statements she made without being questioned by a doctor, without being questioned by law enforcement. She volunteered statements that she would not have to be given Miranda before she's volunteering a statement. She, you know, she alleges she's not, she's not pregnant. Um, she's not had sex. I mean, all those things. So we believe it's a, an appropriate um, condition of release. We believe the court can say that she can be in the same classroom with him. She can, you know, she can attend the same campus. That that's not what the restriction is. But it only runs us to this one person in this case, right? That's right, Judge. It only runs to one person, and and I don't want to get into other medical privileges that she has. Suffice it to say, I have made certain that she's had proper medical care since. And uh, with uh, uh, doctors that I have lots of confidence in, in a different community. Okay. And uh, well, the, the judge finger was confronting and his fear. Uh, uh, we've uh, gone to great, we're taking great steps to make certain that doesn't happen. Well, I, I would really like to look at this more, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to allow, I'm going to modify the conditions of release. I'll allow her to go. It's New Mexico State and Las Cruces, right? That's correct, Your Honor. It is. Big university. Huge. I don't know what the student count is, but I'm sure it's several thousand. Um, Las Cruces is a sizable city. Um, I, I personally, counsel, I, I'm, I'm really trying to, get in my mind how you can invoke a domestic violence 
prohibition against personal contact, first off, nobody's invoked the DB statute. There's been no allegation of domestic violence. I don't think that translates into this. I really don't. My, my, my gut reaction is that's, that does not translate. Granted, you can order that anybody who's under charges cannot commit any further criminal acts. And I certainly think that's absolutely reasonable. She should get her conditions revoked if she gets charged with any further criminal acts. But I don't see how the DV statutes can even be applied in this case, notwithstanding what Judge Schubert said originally or anything else. Certainly, she commits any other criminal act. She should have her conditions least reviewed, absolutely, but I, I really don't think that a DV statute defining continuing personal relationship and prohibiting such can be translated into this situation. Um, that's my read on it, honestly. I think you can stretch that. I do advise that she may not commit any other criminal acts of any sort. I don't want her to get a traffic ticket or anything else. Um, I will let her go to, to Mexico State. That's a big, big university. Thank you, um, Judge. I'll do an order on it. Uh, Judge, how many days or weeks may Ms. Lutz and I have to do findings and conclusions? And I assume the state would rather I proceed with mine first so they can respond. But I don't care how we want to do it. Uh, I don't want to do this. I wish I had a good clerk to help me with my legal research. You know, this is all on me. So you got little old me doing this, too. So. Well, Judge, um, what if I have my, uh, Ms. Lewis, what suggestions do you have for when we How get long do we need to get a findings of fact to me? Okay. Well, Your Honor, we usually do two weeks. Um, and so then we'll give the, it's going to go to the second one. Got somebody, all right, I'm going to mute them, but. If, if you're going to have been trying to get in and out constantly by using our names on on here, uh, folks, I need everyone to mute other than counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Two weeks is fine. I can get mine to the court in two weeks. Okay. Uh, and conclusions on these issues, right. okay. and I'll do the orders on the others. Okay. Uh, and, and and then, Your Honor, if we can have an additional uh, week before we have to file our findings and conclusions. Sure, that's fine. That's fine with me, Judge. No and worries. and uh, do we want to do anything on that deposition situation today, Ms. Luce, or do you, would you rather we wait on that and you and I just talk? Your Honor, I would ask that if we can't come to an agreement on it, that we set that at a later date. Sure, that's fine. Okay. I got to tell you, both counsel, and I really do appreciate you're both rational, confident, really good attorneys, and I really enjoy having you in my court and you save this court a whole lot of headache. I appreciate that. That's duly noted. All right. That's all I had for today. Okay. <laughs> Isabel is having a little hissy fit here on our sound system, I guess. I don't know who Isabel is. All right. Okay, counsel. And I miss Lucy's screen. Okay, no, she hadn't. It was frozen for a second. All right. Uh, if you'll all prepare me the appropriate orders, what I'm taking under advisement is the issues on the suppression motion and privilege motion. And you'll submit findings of fact uh, to me in two weeks and then an additional week after that. All right. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, folks. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll be in recess.